any case, understanding teenagers, the generation gap. Is that lesson 9, chapter 9? Yes, yes, yes. 9. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I've, I, I, I've, I've listened to young people now for some time already, always smart, always think they know something and how advanced they are. Um, and then you have your, your general attitude that Puritan morality, morality and tradition family structure, including opinion of John, are outmoded. What a load of nonsense. If you just look at the world, you'll see that it's nonsense. So still parents get maligned, even those who sometimes want to give a good spanking. And we are eating the fruit of the land. <coughs> Suicides, crime, gangsterism, substance abuse, divorce, anxiety, and mental instability, always on the upswing. What are the primary causes? The neglect of teenagers by parents during childhood. There's no discipline, no proper discipline, or no understanding of the word discipline. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the problem lies sometimes. Um, my friend had quite a few sermons on this issue, and then I have another friend who does the same. For example, there's no chores in the children. In some homes there's chores, in other homes there's no chores. And people don't see the value of even a chore, which is, is a strange thing, because through a chore you can teach a child order, um, you can teach them patience, depending on what they're doing, um, you can teach them perseverance. There's so much character traits that can be developed through um, the use of a chore and the consistency with which it's done. Um, not only that, if you're going to give them a chore, first show them how to do it, so by the way, and just hand them the chore. Especially if they're still small and they don't know too much. Um, they are shiftless, delinquent because of lack of parental guidance. And very important, would they not rather welcome a, a life that is stable and purposeful? I think kids desire that. I think they want to be disciplined sometimes. Um, even with the autistic kid, we find the same thing. Yeah. He, he knows what he's doing. Yes, he has his moments and so forth. But he knows what he's doing. He knows when it's a route. He understands some words quite well. Yeah. Um, he knows when to use them, how to use them. <laughs> and Meryl is not giving him an inch. They are unable to find such a life in the new structures and attitudes of society. There is no parent who is humble of purposeful and successful living. If the home is not structured, if there is no purpose in, in or, or what we call mutual goals from parents and so forth, the children also become aimless. There is no, because there is no rudder in the home, there is no proper steering of the ship. Mm. So you wonder why they end up the same way. Staying. The home is an important place for us. The duty of parents is to help children develop attitudes and traits that will enable them to live successfully. It's the foundation for both children and adolescents. Um, I'm thinking of, of the one and the little ones that we used to know, as we taught them as we went along. Part of, of, of discipline in childhood, there will be a lot of yes and no's in early childhood. But in, as they become teenagers and so forth, you start explaining things. I don't think it should start with teenagers. I think it should start right at the beginning, where there's not just a yes and a no. You must learn how to talk to your children mm -hmm. from the very beginning. If you're going to Tell him to throw away the dirt and stuff. You can talk to him about germs. You can talk to him about um, the home looking neat and presentable. <coughs> There's lots of things that you can explain to him. Um, Justine, uh, used to, used to, the first one we looked after, her remark was, Why do you eat? Uncle Glenn explained. And we all replies, One eats, one explains. And it works well. So there. I'm the one that sits down and explains. 
Uh, if I had a boy, I suppose it would be different because then I would spank his bottom if I needed to. Mm -hmm. um, no one gonna hide him once. Um, and not even, if you could call it a hiding. He just got one smack on the bottom. But that was just to to entrench what Meryl had done already. Because he got, he got a smack on his bottom from her. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't listen, so I came alongside. And our, our goal was mutual, so I spanked him too. And so he looked at both of us and realized this is one. So let me not fight this course anymore. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to lose this battle. Yeah. So, puberty, the stage when sexual maturity is reached. The person becomes capable of reproduction. Um, the penis is critical for the developing child. The penis is changing body appearance and chemistry. Again, even with an autistic child, I've watched these changes. Um, there's different changes, even with him, even though, even if some parents don't see them as whole, um, I would want to see my child first as a person with limitations rather as a limited person. Hmm. Because if I change the way I define it, I treat him differently. Hmm. Um, if I say he's a whole person with limitations, then I give him every opportunity to progress in life, even if that progress is limited. It doesn't matter. He must be given every opportunity. He must be treated like any other child because he will go through the same changes. His body will lengthen, his arms, he'll be awkward. He'll be suffering emotions, mm. emotional instability because of the sexual changes and stuff mm. like that. So he needs the same kind of help. And it's going to be even more difficult for him mm. because of his limitations in understanding certain concepts. So there's going to be a lot more patience around the time spent with him. Mm. Um, some parents is not always willing to spend their time with children who are handicapped when they go through these phases. They are no different from any other child in that regard. What do you even mean? Um, <coughs> indications of puberty. Moving to the next stage, well, obviously, I think we're pretty much aware of this. All girls menstruate, boy begins having nocturnal emissions, excreting excess semen, and you need to teach your children about these changes because they need to deal with the emotional aspect to it. Um, uh, one of my friends also has a handicap. I sat him down and said, There's your son, he's growing, these changes are happening. Um, you need to, to, to work with it through it because he's going to experience the same thing. So take your time out to go and sit down with him and, and talk to him and, and watch him when there's changes in his body and his growth and the way he deals with himself. Um, it was strange because uh, there was uh, a friend visiting her daughter and um, he went to go dress himself up. And we are looking at this and we say, oh my goodness, he's going through the same stuff. There's nothing different here. Because mm -hmm. he's now wanting her to, to see. He's being all macho. It was just an odd thing to mm -hmm. see. Um, and when that happened, I sat down his father. I said to him, you need to take that. That is a clear sign that there's changes happening. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's minute, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, it's things you're going to have to watch and do. <coughs> they say girls at age 11 and boys between 12 and 16, um, most of the changes happen. Um, between 12 and 14, the difference between them is especially marked with girls normally more mature than boys. How many more? Well, no. What's your thoughts on masturbation during these periods? Because there are some yeah, they, that would go against it. Yeah, there, there, there's some who say you can't just use a gun as you please. Um, and so from that perspective, they, <laughs> they would argue against it. Yeah. The, the, the more serious argument is is that you are sitting against your body. Yes. Um, well, there's a couple of, but I mean, you're not really sitting against your body. Technically, how are you? I mean, <laughs> to me, it's a very uh, a movement because these changes I must go through. Yeah, it's just, I mean, there are guys who don't want to sleep around. Yeah. But how do they, how do you 
relieve yourself because it built uh, it, it's not an easy simple don't do it or just do it and have fun with it. There is. Look, um, uh, if there's been no grid involved, uh, it changes obviously mm. the, the, the parameters. Because um, I think you should be aware of now what the, 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 the negatives are with regards to pornography. Oh, no, no, no. It's, pornography it's is a different not, story. It, it's the same like substance abuse. Mm. You'll be hooked and you'll have difficulty getting off, off it. I think this, this, no, this is one thing. Um, if, if the word says, if I look at another and I long for a really great cinema, what do you consider? Great cinema. I mean, Jesus, Jesus um, laid it down. It yeah. says um, that your temple is the body of the Holy Spirit. So, what that suggests to me is that even though I might experience it, and then for a time that it might be getting real, it can be brought under control. Yeah. Um, but easier said than done. But it can be done. Yeah. I mean, I've had prior times where I could bring it under control. I've had times I couldn't. Okay. I've had births. Yes. So, and I think one mustn't beat yourself over the back sometimes mm. about these things. Um, I think one needs to constantly hand over yourself. Over yourself, the Lord. The, 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 um, the times I find is very difficult to beat is the amount of time you've given thought to it. Do. If you've been thinking sin. about it all day, you're not cutting yes. that thoughts. This is where sin starts. It starts. It starts yes. yes. And it grows and it eventually leads to death, is the other word that mm. comes to mind. Um, and because we know where sin starts, you see, so if you, if you put all of those things together, all of those texts together, well then, then the issue of control, um, and control is a huge thing. If you look, for example, at uh, I think it's Second Peter chapter one, because mm. I read an article once where a guy said now, and, and this was missionaries, mm. and where their husbands and whatever goes away for a long time, and now the woman is used to. A sexual relationship, and some would say they would do it, but uh, with the thought that they're with their husbands. Yes. And they find that there's peace there. You, you understand? They find there's peace in that. In that. Yeah. Because it's with. So it's all about the peace. Yes. Yeah. Um. But um, yeah, one has to define the the the, the, the difference between condemnation mm -hmm. and and conviction as well. Yeah. No, I'm just asking you the question no, no, no. because because with youngsters and with people, this that is a it's a critical it's, it's a critical thing, thing in their lives. This is where where a rape also might eventually come from. If you know, if you completely abstain yourself, there's other problems. Uh, yes. That's what I'm asking. I'm honestly asking. I, I don't always have the answers neither. So I'm also <laughs> what do you do? I don't want to say issue is over. That, but that is a critical point that you just made. They think of their husbands, or the husband needs to be thinking of his wife. Of his if wife. Anything, if else, anything else, yes. Then it surely has to fall, fall in the wrong of sin and has to be dealt with very differently mm. because then there's other issues. In a, yeah, exactly. Which is at if you're thinking of the girl that you've been checking out on the bus, That's you've, in your heart, in your mind, you've had sex with her. Technically. Yes. Let's let, let not be around the bush. <laughs> That's why I want the other guys here. Yeah. But they're not here. Uh, it is a growth and change. It's a pity, this is critical stuff. Because as a pastor, this is just stuff you're going to deal with. Puberty is also marked by a growth which continues for 3 to 4 years. Girls between 9 and 10, boys between 11 and 12, which is a big about 50 years only. So the sexual organs mature, girls get headaches, cramps, abdominal pains, and some with as serious abdominal pains. Yeah. Even so that they need medication for it. Um, they also get thicker voices, however, not as badly as, as guys. Um, 
the voice was had quite a few physical changes, thicker pores, larger openings using lens, more active possible acne, and some have really bad acne if not treated properly. But then it also relates to diet and one possibly can control it. They start drinking water during that age, it's drinks and whatever they can find except water. Um, voice deepens, male mammary gland made large, then disappears apparently. Um, so, with the busy growth, there will also be fatigue and, 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 and lethargy. So, um, when, you, when your child is at this age, um, then when he's tired, he might be genuinely tired. <laughs> and yeah. you don't think like that as parents. Um, also ready for heavier duties at school and at work, fatigue may result in nervousness and irritability. Yeah, it was actually funny now, the other day you picked up a five liter bottle with ease. No problem, you just picked it up. Mm. I could actually see the strength in your body. Um, when you do it from hand and sit down. Yeah. Because when he's with, the, with Mel and I, it's really helpful, he's giving up with us. Effects of physical changes, yes, true. Parents need to grasp these changes because of emotional and physical changes, treat them differently. Continue treating as children will lead to behavioral problems and poor attitudes. There's always, they go, yeah, most of them feel rigid during this age in any case, and then take it out in the rest of the world possibly. Mm -hmm. They would draw from playmates, this one little boy in one family that I sat with the parents, he was slightly withdrawn. And when the conversation was over and they told me what was wrong with me, I said to them, um, you know that your boy is normal? And it's actually abnormal that you don't have enough info about this. Sure. Uh, well, I didn't say in so much words. I did say it very nicely. Um, <laughs> but he told me, sure. I, yeah, but I advised them this year, here's materials, source the materials, don't read up. Because mm. your boy is going through a lot of changes. You tell me he's, he's beginning to lay long in his bed, for example. Um, I ask him, is he sleeping in another room? Is they say, no, his sister's ex and open, you need to separate them now. Is there another room? So they say, yes. Except I'll well, separate them immediately. Because he's needing his space, he's needing his privacy right now. Um, he's exploring his body, and you're not giving him that opportunity to do so. Neither are you sitting him down and talking to him about it. Mm. So I think you need to now go and arm yourself with some information and I gave him the resources and I said go back. And then you've had problems after that again with him. Mm. Uh, because now they began to understand what was happening in his life. He was able to sit down and talk to him. He was visiting a, a, a little girlfriend uh, from school and I said, but that's normal. Mm. Why are you worried about it? The only thing that I, I'm concerned about is, is that you're not um, you haven't been to these people's home. You've dropped them off, but you've never gone inside the people's home, so you don't know what's going on inside. That concerns me though. So that's something that you need to change. You need to take it next time. Go inside, introduce yourself, and go check out the home. Because that's where your son is going. That's where influence may happen, and mm. you might not even be aware of what's happening there. Um, there's hyperactivity in childhood, now constantly tired. They change. There's a complete turnaround. Studies may be neglected and home chores avoided. Well, it's, it's not with all kids. Uh, well, but it's, it's, there's it's a little general. bit of a, it's yeah. a, little bit of a rebel. Yeah. Yeah. And the less time their parents spend for the kids, the more. There's they the get awkwardness out. because of the developing body. There's listlessness, but also restlessness. Um, interests are changing. Yeah. And then they want to play the piano, then they want to do the violin, and so forth oh, and so forth. Yeah. At times, it's disagreeable, uncooperative, critical of others. Especially his mother. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, yeah, they think, and generally they think they can get away with more with their moms. Um, inclined to cause trouble among friends and immediate family. At the end of puberty, his behavior becomes more mature and settled. Once it's the maturing of sex organs, he's also more conscious of sex matters. They start making comparisons, they source information on their own. Uh, which is not always always good because you're not involved and you need to be involved this, at this time by sitting them down and talking through things. 
or the, the birds and uh, the bees. Yes, or, or creating um, opportunities. It's well, it's not a case of arranging a meeting. You know what no. I mean? Oh, you need to find little opportunities where you, where he gives you the lead, or he asks the right question, or a question related to it, and you can maybe steer it and just ask other questions and. Find your way. So tell me what goes you think is necessary. <laughs> <laughs> the parents are not always that clued up. Sometimes they are just so clueless and very um, inept in dealing with the stuff. Mm -hmm. Development during early adolescence. Yeah, there's two stages actually. There's early adolescence and the late adolescence. Characteristics, this means growing to maturity only now. So it's only starting. Begins with growth and maturity of sick origin, changes in physical structure, emotional, mental, and social development. So it can coincide with what we call teenage years and in between life. No longer children, but not adult yet. Time to adopt certain adult standards and values. But they've only got the experience of children. Now this is a period where they start developing their own set of moral standards. Um, even though you've taught them, they will develop their own set of standards. And they will try and figure out how yours fit in with theirs actually. <laughs> it's not necessarily of them owning yours. Um, They need guidance, obviously, so they need room for thinking and decisions. Um, they're not ready to be completely responsible for their lives without supervision. So, what, what I think is sometimes in conversation where they raise issues. Uh, now, the other day there was an issue that came up of, of um, the one principal at the school wanting to, to um, build a toilet just for the gay, lesbian, transgender, and so forth community. Yeah, of course. Um, so the mom asked uh, the daughter, so what do you think about it? Which I thought was so clever. Mm. Um, allow her to think, think something through, yeah. to develop exactly. her own way of thinking. Um, the answer would be pretty interesting yes, as well. Yes, yes. That would be very yes. interesting to hear what the child actually thinks yeah. of this bizarrity. Um, not only that, um, there would be other questions. What do you think of somebody that's different from you, for example? Put it that way. Mm. Yeah, but, but, but it would actually be interesting to hear what the child would have to say about the bathrooms, I'm not going to lie, that would interest me. <laughs> it was an interesting conversation, but I, I, I was happy, though, quite happy the way the mom guided it got the conversation. Yeah. Got her to speak about what she thinks, how she experiences it, and um, any, how any, she... Any, how any, any learning yeah. on some stuff, yeah. because from, I think from a child, you know, the mind is still very innocent to, mm -hmm. to, to, to a large degree. I think yeah. one can learn a lot yeah. from that mind, you know, just the way that mind thinks. Yeah. 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 By nearly 17, nearly the adult keep greater freedom for directing his own life. Um, often people keep them locked up. Uh, they may have dreamed of a vocation that was not responsible for choosing one. They're not expected to act like an adult. Um, so, when it comes to the freedom, that relates to time sometimes, that relates to um, letting them sleep out sometimes, sleepovers and so forth. Again, you don't have control of a lot of things once they leave the home. And you're going to have to reduce an idea that you don't have control. Mm. I think that's the parents' problem. They want to control. They want to believe that the only way that this is going to be a good boy or a good girl is to keep them locked up. Mm. But if you don't let them out, if you don't let them loose, they will never learn how to really make decisions. And decision making is, a, is an important part of life. Um, so you must allow the child to make decisions. Uh, Neil Anderson said, you know, if you're building the foundation, the right foundation from, from the beginning, be free to let your child loose. Mm -hmm. And you know what? They might go off the rail a little bit, mm -hmm. but they will always strike back well, to home. Yeah. Because it's been yeah. grounded. Yeah. Here's, here's the thing even if, if there was a set of um, um, standards or a moral standard in the home, and a good one or a biblical one, when children move through these phases in any case, there's some 
who have a high standard and some who have a low standard. In any case, even though there was maybe a high standard in the whole, that's not necessarily the case that it's going to be a high standard. Mm -hmm. It is true though that they follow the example then of the parents in most cases. Yeah. But not exactly. Yeah, but not I mean, exactly. But I mean, children who go uh, grown up in good homes don't necessarily turn out to be good people. No. Um, so, kids brought up in bad homes don't necessarily turn out to be bad people. I mean, you, you, you're still stuck with the... But if there are certain godly principles that you build into them from, from the beginning, I mean godly stuff, like biblical stuff, uh, there would be a, 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 a steer back to that, but then, yes. uh, then what godliness did you build into them? That's the other thing, if it was this religious, you know, type of thing that would obviously chase them away. If it was too ex too on the other side, I don't know. But yeah, I think I think these things do have do have yes. an, do have an effect. Before modern times, there was time for young people to assume responsibility. Now we don't necessarily have problems and stuff like that, but they have to assume some responsibility for some things. There's a home. Um, there's more than one person in the home. Um, if you're going to learn how to serve and to love others and to respect others, including their property and so forth, then it's in the home. Um, and it comes by giving them responsibility or assuming responsibility for certain parts of the home. Um, it's like parents who have a struggling period where there's not a lot of money, they just get to talk to their children to say there's not enough money to do this or to buy that. I think it's the best time to teach them about money. Um, and how to assume responsibility for maybe saving water, um, um, planting greens, um, fresh stuff, instead of having to buy the stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a good time to teach them those things. Now, if child labor laws in industrialization have largely changed this pattern, <coughs> person during this stage is emotionally unstable and often makes planning for the future difficult. Association of boys and girls is vital for future choices regarding the life of mates. <coughs> yeah, when I was still in grade one and grade two, we I was at the school with the boys was this I had a fence in between the girls of that side. Look, I had a fence. You had a fence. But you're not concerned about it because everybody's playing on, it, well, on both sides and nobody's looking at each other really because it's grade one and grade two. Yeah, no, <laughs> that she cares. At that stage, boys don't like girls. <laughs> Making decisions is all the more difficult if the child with us listened has been marked by discipline that was too authoritarian. Um, my father was a bit of an authoritarian with girls, uh, and, and that would work out not too well for us. Um, he was an authoritarian too with, with the children up to a certain stage, but when they were the holding, we always let go. Because um, he realized he couldn't do too much anymore at a certain age. Mm -hmm. They would still make their own choices. Um, it's not like he capitulated. He's, I think he came to his senses to understand that there's not much he could do now. He'd done what he could. Um, Right or wrong, me. It was the. Not his choice. Yeah, it was their life now. Yeah. They had to make their own choices. Um, divorce and death can often increase the complexity of the situation, the decision making one. They may be frustrated, but yet still desire help and from adults. They may be afraid to discuss problems with family or friends. They may appear even inadequate to meet his own problems or fears that they lose the independence. Solving his problems is more important for the development of self-confidence. So, during this period of freedom, that is where he's going to learn how to solve problems in any case. He might come and ask you for advice. You might find an opportunity to give him advice or, or to, to maybe just steer him in the right direction like a counselor would, would like by asking the right questions or prompting him with certain lines or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so one needs to be careful during this stage. Um, conflict with parents. Adults sometimes at a loss to know how to 
to help teenagers because often they will not listen to reason. My goodness. They appear irresponsible and unreliable, sometimes turning to gangs, delinquency or drugs. Um, and if there's a negative response from the parent, it just blows up the whole thing. But what parents don't understand sometimes is, is that the period is difficult for both of them, the adults and the adolescents. Mm -hmm. They've got their own struggles with keeping this guy, child in check. And then they forget that they first need to understand that he's going through the changes and that they need to now start managing these changes instead um, in a very different way from what they previously did where it was authoritarian before and it's just a simple yes or no. Now the explanations is required and they're not often uh, um, able to do that or informed to do that. Um, there's this desire to be treated as an adult, but still um, they are dependent. And so you need to balance it out. They will show their dependence. They will even uh, 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 suck you dry from your money <laughs> if they can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a religious doubt during this period because comparing their beliefs with their friends, remember they are meeting other people now? Yeah. Um, there's other influences. <coughs> other influences and may conf cause confusion when they differ. The science courses may encourage skepticism as well, which we often don't take to in into account. Um, they give life orientation, for example, at schools now. Yeah. But what is it based on? This God and this culture, so uh, all I'm saying is based on culture because there's no God involved in this life orientation given to them. And parents don't take note of small things mm. like this mm. to sit them down and to tell them about it. Where I uh, try and explain to them and say to them, okay, where does this, where is it born out of? How did this happen as it was? And to actually sit the children and take off to, to teach them uh, because that is what you should be teaching them, not the school. What's your thoughts with Christian, fully Christian-based schools and secular schools? It just it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. I've got mine. I, I but I prefer the integration, integrated one. Um, if parents do their work properly home, the way they should, then a Christian-based school is not a necessary a necessity. Yeah. Um, but because parents are not doing the work, they shift off their accountability to someone else. That's someone else. The same like they do with the Sunday school. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the secular schools is very as for the development. I think it's yeah. extremely important. Well, church attendance usually drops off and then we also look at the fact that they're more responsive to discussion than a formal lecture. So we will change the mode of teaching. Um, the church that I was on Sunday uh, mm -hmm. The, the pastor was able to move between the children and the, the adults so easily. Mm. Come down to their level and come back up again. Go down to the level and come back Yo. again. That's an art, eh? But I, I was just sitting there was in awe of this guy. Yeah, that's an art. <laughs> I was able to move between the two. Yeah, in childhood they say there's daily prayers, but in adolescence they may pray only under unusual circumstances. So, you know, when, he, when he's taken into much of a drink and suddenly there's an accident, then it's, oh Lord, please help me, my parents find me now. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, and unusual circumstances. Yeah. It's obviously the, the, the influence of fears, um, which is, the, that's always going to be a, 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 not a problem, it's to be expected. They are going to. We are social beings. We're going to meet other people. Yeah. We're going to hear other opinions. Um, the key thing during this time is, is that parents must generalize specific rules into principles that will enable them to make decisions regarding various situations. Situations is going to change consistently in front of them. Uh, in rugby, they say to us, play what is in front of you. And the child is now faced with a new situation. And now he's going to apply this thing. And now he's sitting and he's saying, but this doesn't make sense. He never taught me how to deal with this. He never taught me how to deal with the, what we call a white lie, for example. Um, um, my friend just lied. He said, okay, did he, 
but did it do the right thing now? Um, like now the other day when my cat disappeared from my tank, um, because that's the last time I saw my cat, this young sister came past my car, then the girl was looking my way and I'm looking at her and thinking, I'm not sure why you're looking because you're with your friends, but that's the last time I saw my cat. Um, so there's that pleasure amongst each other. Even though there's a model standard inside the home, they develop their own or they operate differently with their friends as, as opposed to in their home. They will rather keep into the, the standard sets by their friends as opposed to the standard set by their parents. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so what does it do? I mean, you tell him to respect other people's property. Yes, with his friends, and they decide to spray uh, the cars. So if he walks away, he's a he's a he's seen as a traitor. He's seen as uh, less than a man because apparently they are now men and they can make their own choices. Mm -hmm. So they they give things their own definition or concepts their own definition during those moments, and you're caught up in it. And you need to now decide how am I going to respond to it. Because I might lose all of my friends. Then again you might not. Mm. But you wouldn't think that way generally, maybe in that situation. Mm. And so the child needs to know how to respond now. Uh, hey, do I rather call my dad and say, let me go home. Um, satisfactory transition usually is made by those who have had firm foundations of morality laid during childhood. If not, they may break under the strain of peer influence. So they develop their own moral code. But they're still confused by the ambiguities and the different varying codes that are around them. <coughs> Lies can be good, but there are situations where they may be good. Um, for example, when, when the Nazis came to knock on certain doors and some Germans eat um, some Jews away. That circumstance is like a good. But that child wouldn't know that difference, would they? Not if you really sat them down and worked through some issues, some practical issues with them. Um, they obviously develop a conscious during this time. Previously, you, you control the behavior when you threaten punishment for disobedience. Now his conscious will begin to function in order to exercise control of the behavior as he begins to make his own decisions. Mm. If you relinquish control before the conscience develops, the adolescent is left with confusion. If you maintain strict control after the conscience has developed, the adolescent will rebel. Um, it always has, it swings mm. one way or the other. It's the balance that you as the parent must find between the two, when to be strict and when not to, when to let go and say, so leave him now, be, let him make his own decision, right or wrong. Um, then let me sit him down, even when it's wrong, and there's repercussions to it. Um, he must learn that he can get up, that he can start over. Um, how else are you going to teach him? It says in the word, the righteous falls seven times, and he gets up again, and he starts again. Um, you're going to teach him how to get up again. You need to teach them those things, mm -hmm. so that when they look at God and they understand His love, and they understand His birth, His forgiveness, and they understand that they can get up again because of the love of God, and, and that they don't need to live with guilt and shame of, 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 of falling sometimes. Because it's going to happen, it happens to all of us in life. We fall from time to time. But that is waiting always on the other side. Um, conscious develops in relation to bad and good feelings as the result of approval or disapproval of service and behavior by others. Albeit via religious teachings, teachings, parental influence, or peers. So, teaching about friendship and friends. Um, why are you making it so difficult for yourself? Maybe because you chose the wrong friends and never learned how to choose friends properly. Mm -hmm. So now you can't guide him. So if you don't know, go and find out. Um, there's the pastor, 
that you might be able to go and speak to first and then come back because you know you're not being informed. There's information freely available nowadays. Um, There's guilt and shame that they have to deal with, uh, which is an unpleasant feeling, and I think you you have dealt with that in your own life. Um, and there's a desire to avoid this feeling. Yeah. And if there's a desire to avoid this feeling, says Vito and his wife, it motivates to maintain the adopted moral standard. I know they have to live with guilt and shame. Oh, Jesus took them away, didn't they? They don't have to. And that's the thing. Teach the child they don't have to live with it. Um, <coughs> there's a third piece. While he's determining still whether God exists, he's also seeking a conscience which is based on the will of God. But often life is confusing and the recourse is rebellion or withdrawal or withdrawal. If his most Standards is inconsistent and st unstable while, work while working out a reasonable structure for himself which will give two direction to his life, then be patient with him. Walk with him. It, it, it's almost like you're busy counseling yourself. And you need mm -hmm. to walk with him during these phases. Discipleship. Yeah. You need to walk with him. That's it. If you can teach your boy during this time how to walk with him, you can actually teach him how to disciple other people. You actually lay a foundation for a lot of things. You might teach him how to walk with friends who are struggling, who are going through very difficult periods and phases of their life. It doesn't mean when your son is congregating with what you consider the wrong person that he is necessarily dropped his standards. He might, you might have taught him very good values, and now he's being a friend to somebody, and you think the person is busy influencing him. Be careful. Sit down first, find out the facts, make sure. Kids are uh, easily influenced because uh, are the kids who never had good influence from their family. That's, that's, that's the general thing I've picked up. They say suicides is often, a, often happen when they give over to peer influence or they act or behave below the adopted moral standard. So they sit with this mm. guilt. And we talked about this earlier on the authority that we just don't know how it changes to how can you make decisions, explaining the rules, um, explaining princip underlying principles um, to make it possible to size up each situation and come to a decision consistent with the moral standard. So there's this tension always. Parents saying they are inexperienced, I was there, I know how it works. The children saying, when am I going to learn to make my own decisions, give me some space. They must gain some independence and they will rebel if you are too strict in your parental authority. On the other hand, they do need continued guidance, so be there. Watch, look for the moments for teaching. Um, show them respect during this particular period. How else will they develop? Um, respect for others, if you're not showing respect for their opinions and their thinking, um, which is developing at this stage. You have the late adolescents, they normally called older teenagers, they got the Bible study complete high school, um, they also reach a degree of physical, emotional, and behavioral maturity. They can use the arms and stuff much better now. <laughs> um, there is more experience on which to base decisions. The instability gradually gives way to stability in choices, moodiness decreases, and so forth. Um, in their late teens, he has or will face three significant decisions whether or not to follow Christ, regarding vocation, and regarding a lifetime companion. It's three decisions that he will make at that particular point in time, uh, whether he decide upon a girlfriend or a boyfriend. That what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Some children decide a little later, and some children are able to take a gap year. The gap year is not good for all the children. Some children don't need a gap year. They don't need a gap year. Now, if, they, if, if he's going to do a gap year, mm -hmm. I'm going to send him back on a camp somewhere 
in the Bundes for six months, so he can take his gap year there and learn a few more things. But that's what we need. Not be sitting at home for a year taking a gap year. Hmm. Um, that's not happening. <laughs> he, that, that gap year needs to be a significant uh, for him for the rest of his, his life. Um, so the, the decision needs to be taken also about what that gap year will look like. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, decisions, these decisions are made larger without knowledge, growing out of experience. Um, significant parents, so, uh, problems. Um, obviously, they less dependent on parents. The tension in the home is less, obviously. Parents seem to be less restrictive and protective and allow a little bit of more freedom. Um, great emotional stability also. Uh, but that more often relates to owning a car, smoking, drinking and staying up late. <laughs> yeah. We thought we were so big when we could sit all night up, eh? Fall asleep at six. Yeah. And then the year just before we did that, come, 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 get up, it's time to church. <laughs> There's anger during this time. Um, obviously because interruption of personal activities. Because we don't give them the space sometimes. Um, there's more control over angry responses. You'll see a, a change constantly. Um, if there's proper management of this phase, you'll see the change eventually take place. And that is the goal ultimately. Um, to see your child grow to a mature person who make decisions for himself, who can look a situation in the face and, and, and own it, first of all, and then secondly say, this, yeah, this might be the best route to go. Or let me stand back from this one. Mm -hmm. I don't think I need to get involved here. They need to develop that kind of, mm -hmm. uh, very, uh, they need to be self-assertive. And say, okay, this is the best option here. That is the best option for this and this reason. They will be able to think it through now already. Um, there's fewer things to fear than younger teens, but they worry more apparently when it comes to college, money, academic achievement, and popularity of season roles which they confront. When young men, sex and money is the major items. Young women is focused on personal attractions and social and family relationships. They deal with full maturity. Maturity, and he says there's four evidences for that. They will be emancipated themselves from the home, um, make decisions for themselves, support themselves, and even they are even happy when they're away from home, apparently. <laughs> Members of his family are now treated as friends and are shown affection. Uh, they they socially mature. Um, a socially mature person may attempt to change his friends, and a socially immature person. Sorry, that's immature. They attempt to change his friends and criticize them. A mature person accepts them as they are. Mm. And that is why I'm saying to you, be careful. Your son or daughter is maybe with a, with a person that you might not necessarily accept or choose them as a friend. But it might be because they accept the person as they are. They don't mm. have a problem with the person themselves, but you have a problem. And they actually are able to deal with this person. And this person might take to them precisely because they've accepted them for who they are. And because of that, they might be a strong witness to this person if they are Christian, if that boy or, 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 or girl of yours is a Christian already. Um, they might be a better witness than what you are. Relations of parents to teenagers. He's described the dilemma which parents face, how to help them when help is resented, how to guide when guidance is rejected, how to communicate when attention is taken as an attack. Parents are public enemy number one, that's my own little thing. They desire to res <laughs> respect but get contempt. Um, recognize the psychological foundation of rebellion. Avoid retaliation if, if, as far as possible. Um, Complete capitulation to the demands and targets of teenagers is neither a desired course of action nor also. Um, you need to hold to a reasonable course of action. Um, it's not always easy because of the emotions involved, but you need to stick your ground sometimes. Mm. Um, stand your ground. 
is the process of him making his personality to fit into a larger society. And in this transition, he must establish his own identity and autonomy. The process carries him through self-doubt and burdens and consists in personal pain and anxiety. Um, you must find ways to communicate with him. Like I said, she asked the daughter to express a view, so actually she was listening to her job. Um, and then she corrected the conclusion sometimes. Mm. That's all she actually did, which mm. I thought was brilliant. She didn't criticize the daughter during this time. Um, there wasn't anger because of the way the child was thinking or the child responded to, to, to the situation at school. Uh, to limit yourself to disapproval of wrong actions, um, rather than focus on, the, on praising and noteworthy actions. Disapproval of wrong actions, in, you can rather sit and discuss it with them. They might be required times when it's required, when disapproval is required, um, but that you you take situation one to the other. Don't um, play play. Uh, how, uh, how can I put it now? Um, I think we need to play it by ear sometimes. Garner enough information before we actually decide how we need to respond. It's not something we do always. But it's the same like any other person who goes to court. They first need to find the facts before they can decide if they're guilty. He's given at least a chance. <laughs> and the reason is not always given that. Mm -hmm. um, in the sex education for teenagers, um, I'm going to leave that to you to go, go, give that go there go through that so we can get on to the next one. Um, important. Church and parents should teach that sex is a God-given characteristic of men and women. It is pure and holy within marriage. Its misuse brings guilt, fear and anxiety and will reduce its maximum meaning and joy in the marriage. Um, that they need to read and learn at home. They don't need to be embarrassed about it. <coughs> They know need to conclude that sex is shameful and develop unwholesome attitudes towards it. Because some parents are sometimes too embarrassed or uninformed to answer questions honestly, and that might be the result of it. Does the Bible condemn fornication or adultery? Of course it does. Um, but it does approve sexual relationships for procreation and companionship in marriage. And that is what we need to establish within the home and teach our children why God created the home or family. Teach them not to use people as tools. Um, very important, girls should not tease and provoke boys, because that does happen. Uh, boys, however, on the other side, should not place the burden of resistance on the girl. Um, yeah, one of the things they taught us when we were at college is that the role of the past has changed so significantly in terms of what it does. And one of the things that he must be able to do is to counsel people. And that means that he might have to do other studies besides just attaining his degree in theology. Um, he's going to have to equip himself properly for this role. He might be limited to a certain degree, or maybe you do have pastors, pastors who've done the full courses so they're able to, to act as a, as a professional uh, counsel, mm -hmm. uh, Christian counselor. But there's others who don't have that mm. and um, who are limited in some sense. And one must then be careful to decide what you can handle and can't handle. Um, if you remember, I'm not sure if it was Zwingli or Luther who surrounded themselves with a group of pastors. There was a fraternal, but including that fraternal was also, was also doctors. Mm. Which I found just so beautiful. Mm. And often in our returnals we don't do that. We don't have those people present if, for example, we talk about certain issues. There's certain things that we just can't deal with. That's not our field of study. Mm -hmm. That we need to hand over to the professionals <coughs> instead of us trying to deal with it. Uh, I remember the one guy that I dealt with, I was a bit limited. He uh, had a wife who was bipolar, so I couldn't read up her extensively on the subject to understand what he was going through. And I, I, I recall during the, the sessions in that, that um, 
What he never understood was is that there was someone that believed there. And when I was dealing with him with some of the issues, I never said that to him. I asked him certain questions. And then at the end of the questions, he said to me, she's actually manipulative. He didn't ask me, so are you saying she's manipulative? He said to me, my wife has been manipulating me. Um, and that's one of the characteristics sometimes of people that are bipolar. Um, but he was never able to manage this properly. Um, mm. But he loved this woman. And it, it was just something else for me to say. He really, besides the fact that she had this handicap, he really and truly loved this woman and wouldn't let her go for anything in the world. Mm. Um, besides all of the problems that it brought to the marriage, um, he was just not clued up as to how to deal with her. Mm. And maybe I had awakened that in him at least to go and see himself and beat up on the subject. Um, and maybe that's what I should have done. I should have sent him to a trained professional. In fact, I, I gave him a little booklet about a couple uh, who, where the husband in, in, in that particular case was the one with bipolar. And the wife and the husband had actually learned how, with the grace and help of God, God learned how to manage the problem. Yeah. And they wrote a little booklet about it. Uh, a tremendous lesson. Yeah. yeah, sometimes God heals. Yeah. And sometimes you got to live with it. And that's the thing. Um, on, a, on a missionaries that live with um, a bipolar uh, depression. Mm -hmm. Take very yeah, and then move on. We, in fact, I think one of the early fathers, I can't remember yeah. which one, it is said of him that he suffered of depression. Is um, it Banyan? No, not Banyan. Banyan? No, 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 it's much. I'm talking about your first to the third century. Oh, uh, okay. The really early fathers. I um, can't get his name now. But he actually suffered from depression. The minister primarily focused on the psychological and spiritual needs which are brought on by physical disabilities. Doctors focus on the physical ailments. Yeah. Many people become sick because of anxiety over their own meaning and destiny. Yeah. Um, like I said to you once, um, with this one particular girl that I dealt with, she had um, done her articles. When she was done with her articles, she found out that the boss couldn't sign it off, and she's a Christian. And she's asking why. And I, I remember when we sat down, um, she couldn't sign it off because she's a... He, her boss couldn't sign off the documents because he had been barred. He was a, a chartered accountant. Mm -hmm. But because of, of, of a couple of... Uh, I'm not sure if it's money or stuff that he didn't handle very well. Got to the ears and then they disbarred him. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't able to sign off the articles and he, she was left with the impression that he can't sign it off and he, she's doing her, she's doing her articles in his office, it's his business. So when she's done, he can't sign it off and nobody else can because it was done in that office. Mm -hmm. You can't go to another to sign it off. And it is years that she's been sitting with this man, done and completed the studies. Um, and, and this girl lost it, she cried. Um, she couldn't believe that she had gone through all of this pain. And she was severely tested. And one of my questions to her was, um, what is your view of God now? What has changed about your view of God? Because it surely has been affected, hasn't it? And she struggled for a couple of years. She couldn't get over it. She couldn't um, deal with the fact that it's almost as if God had given her over and she was blaming God for this situation. Mm. This man lied to her um, and, and, and God didn't tell her about it. Yeah. He yeah, the reasoning. Um, so there's all of these questions and that was my, I know during the third session I, I asked her what is your opinion of Father now? How has it changed? And she started crying and she, 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 she 
she was angry. And I, I said to her, maybe you shouldn't be angry with God. Maybe you should be angry with the man who did you in. Maybe you need to sort him out. Uh, if, if that is the route that you want to take. Or maybe you should. Or the alternative is to forgive him. Uh, what did you can tell people to do in, or what to do at that stage. But those were the two courses of action. And she had to decide which course she was going to take. Um, whether to retaliate. Um, to give him over. Yeah, or forgive him. To go on. Start over. Which she did and she eventually finished it. Um, she got her, her article done. And signed off. Yeah, people do not solve, pastors do not solve problems, but guide those who need counsel. <laughs> That's all we actually do, we try and guide. So there's different types of counseling options. Um, a Beatle says, Jesus was not able, able to save all who came to him. Even though, even with his preaching and healing, and the preaching and healing was his primary priorities, he wasn't able to save all who came to him. Both emphasis are usually important today since more than two thirds of the world's population who have seen the gospel and some twenty percent of the people in a given country who are sickness, physical handicaps, imprisonment, and emotional disturbance. Our world is in a terrible state. Even so, how does uh, how does the Roman say even the world groans? Yeah, as it, and is in pain and waiting for the sons of God to be. Oh, quite frankly, Jesus can come yeah. tomorrow. He can actually come tonight. It's our fault. Um, there is much pain in this world um, and it's for that reason that we need to know these things and we need to be ready for this as pastors. We have the types of counseling. Obviously, different types of needs demands different types of counseling. Um, you will have people suffering emotional problems, serious to, not to affect their careers, you have physical illness which will prevent carrying normal responsibilities, there's addictions, there's depression, marital or family conflicts. Um, they don't all require the same type of counseling. And the above may also vary from the level of needing additional information in making a decision to the level of worry, depression and physical and mental stability. They all directly or indirectly affect the home. For example, sudden fit is physical disability. You're in an accident. You lose both your legs. Suddenly there's no income. <laughs> then you have to wait on the road accident fund for five years to pay out. Yeah, I have to You understand? So it takes long. Those those type of adjustments are really serious adjustments for people to make, and the church is not always they when this happens. The pastor offers counseling, but the church might not offer assistance, yeah. real assistance. And, 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 and that was one of the strong suits of the early, early, early first church, was the unity and the sharing of the stuff amongst the brethren. That was so. That was the big thing. Determination of appropriate help. Since the pastor's knowledge and experience are often broader than those of his members, he may be called on to share information in various areas such as careers, guidance, interpreting God's will, or maybe even caring for the aid. <coughs> Each type of needs requires a different approach. The pastor do not have the time or training for some types of problems. So, therefore, you should not deal with problems beyond the scope. If you are busy counseling somebody, out of your field of expertise, then you rather refer. Some cases must be referred to social workers. Mm -hmm. In the cases of rape of small children, somebody like as you have your expertise. For example, if somebody's got psychotic tendencies, yeah, you need to go see a professional. You see a professional. If, for example, a husband is abusing a, a, a wife physically, uh, and you are there. You need to call the police. It's not your business anymore. Mm. As a pastor? Yeah. yeah. You call the police. It's not your business. Um, it it is a charge, though. Uh, for example, listen, if you see a husband and wife fighting, mm. um, 
and you step in between. Chances are one, you could get hurt, or they could turn on you. Yeah. Okay. So you need to be careful in those situations. You call the police immediately. Um, it's a different thing. He's trying to stab at it and you are able to help or assist and maybe stop at it. You so need to be, you, but you need to be very careful. But if they say that after the police they came and then after the, they won't say that. No, 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 it's no, you no. Just they can't. The, they can't. the fact that you call them means that you are trying to help. Yeah. Um, if you could have helped um, and they can prove that you could have helped, you could get yourself into trouble. But that's a different story altogether. But you don't just step in where it's out of your, your, control, yeah. your control or yeah. out of your scope mm -hmm. um, of, 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 of um, expertise. Mm -hmm. You must stop. You must hand over. Mm -hmm. You don't stay with it. <clears throat> a pastor may become a member of a community team composed of doctors, pastors and psychiatrists. Because that's where you will to learn. Um, go and see the professionals themselves. They might be able to assist you with, with how to deal with certain things. Again, knowing when to stop and when to, when to refer, because now you understand that they can deal with certain type of issues. So go see them, and talk to them, make friends with them. By the same token, the past, the psychiatrist may call on the past when the problem area is not his field of expertise. For example, um, I know at one particular school, I'm not going to the school, no, I shouldn't put that name. They, let me take that thing out. They actually call a certain church in to come and help because it's spiritual issues, and they don't know how to deal with it. It's not on the, it's not their expertise. It's interesting, yeah. Huh? Sure. Yeah, it's not the. Expertise. Some actually uh, actually realise that it's a. Uh... So they call in the pastor of the local community to come and assist them, and um, that is also how obviously the word got in. The word of God got into the school. Yeah. I know it's not um, supposed to happen in terms of the rules mm -hmm. of the education department, but they realize that their hands are tied. They cannot, can't go any further. They, yeah. they, they need more than what they can offer. Yeah. Okay, I agree with you about that. that you are handing yeah. over. Yeah. I remember I went to, to see my bishop mm -hmm. because of my child. Yeah. Is a problem, you know, sometimes it can just collapse and whatever. So yeah. I was just worried about it. Mm -hmm. So I just went to the shop to seek out yeah. uh, advice. And then when you just uh, pray and uh, just try to understand all this, yeah. you know, thing, guess what? You just tell me, okay, listen here, yeah. in this church there is doctors, blah, blah, blah. so I will refer you to a doctor. Yeah. And then I went to a doctor, that doctor also sent me to. Kalgrima, Kalgrima, they said, thank you, you said, they just said everything up. It is right. You, you, then I just... Uh, yeah, because we sometimes... How to say you are right? Our yeah. theology demands sometimes that God was working a certain way. Mm -hmm. We cannot demand from God how and when He should work. Mm -hmm. Let Him determine what to do, because He knows best. Mm -hmm. um, that we may ask is okay. He is our Father. He mm -hmm. says we may ask. So you may ask. But let him then decide what he wants to do and what is best for you and for the child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said you must submit to the authorities that he is set in place. Mm -hmm. Doctors have authority. Mm -hmm. Counselors or psychologists have a form of an authority. And you have to. This client <coughs> counselor relationship, and there's different, three different types that we get, is the counselor centered counseling. Uh, it's appropriate when the client needs information mm. more than anything else. The only problem with this thing is, and so he looks for an expert in, in the field where he needs help, he might become dependent on the authority and you must guard against that mm. because that also means that he wants you to assume the responsibility for the outcome. So guard against stuff like that. Okay? Mm. Um, in all the cases of counselling, the client or the person that you're dealing with will always assume responsibility for their own actions and for the course of action as well. Hmm. Because course of action is normally presented, or alternatives, courses of action are presented sometimes by the counsellor. Then you have client-centered counselling, that was counsellor-centered counselling, then client-centered counselling. Here they place the responsibility for the decision firmly upon the client. And the client's inner life is the primary focus in this approach. 
which requires the client to find solutions, source of growth and self-orientation within himself. Here no diagnosis required, but just the receptive listener who gives indirect guidance. Sometimes there's just appropriate statements made at the right time or a question here or there that just helps the person to clarify his person or dilemma. And then very important, the person represent the pastor represents divine truth to most people. So you also have an opportunity to point the, the person to the power of God in his very unique situation. You have then the relation centered counseling. And this happens a lot, a lot of times in marriage mostly, where the counselor seeks to understand the client's concept or image or of his role and his social system. Social system meaning the dad doesn't maybe fully understand his role, mom doesn't fully understand her role, um, and that happens within the framework of a family. Hmm. So he, they must help this person to adjust, change or adjust to the problem causing the conflict. In this case, maybe the role image. Now, what they would normally do is they would sit him down and say to them, define the role or the concept that you're struggling with. And then once they've defined it, they say to them, for example, now, how would your partner define it? So, out of your definition, this is your expectations. But out of your partner's, that is his expectations. And then they need to perhaps redefine that role again. Because she or he might have a very wrong understanding of the role or the concept that's being discussed. Once it's redefined, then, then, then you start with the adjustment period. Um, then the counselling becomes different, obviously, because the person has now agreed to the fact that maybe the definition was wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it needs to be redefined. Mm -hmm. And if I don't redefine it, I'm going to constantly sit with this problem. Maybe the other person needs to redefine their own way, and maybe the person is right. So, then you have what we call su uh, supportive counselling. So the first one was the client counsellor relationship. Uh, you have client, uh, uh, what we call supportive counselling. In this case, mostly in bereavement, where per, uh, persons have lost uh, very close family members or friends, poor people facing death, there's chronic illnesses. And there might be, um, I had one experience with a guy who was um, cancer, and he had it for almost a full, uh, full three years before he passed away. God never healed him from it. Um, there was another lady in our church. While there was other healings in our church from cancer, there was another lady also who died of cancer um, and her husband took care of this woman in a very amazing way up until her death. Um, but he had learned to accept it. Um, we heard his testimony later how oh, we had to work through this and to accept that this was God's will um, for her and for his life. And he never left the church. <laughs> like some people who do when they struggle in situations like that. Mm -hmm. um, he had a strong foundation mm -hmm. and he had kept him. While you might have on the opposite end theologians who have strong foundations in terms of the word, who might revolt against God. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've heard and seen cases like that again. Then there's parents of deformed and mentally deficient children who will need the support of help of the pastor. Um, now, very important, in support of counselling, your presence is more important than words. I remember one evening one of the young uh, guys who had, uh, there was two guys running the youth, and the one youngster called because one of um, the boys in, in the youth had just passed away, and I was not in Cape Town when he called me. Uh, if no, I was teaching, so I was teaching that evening. Mm -hmm. When he phoned, and he said, Glenn, I don't know what to do. Well, he's, um, he's 22 years old. He, he's just started studying. And here he gets called up to a situation like that, because the pastors are away during that week. It's the week where they go away to the to, uh, pastor out. Um, so here he's sitting in the situation. He's phoning me and saying to me, what must I do? I don't know. I said, well, you just need to be there. You don't need to say anything. And then he went quiet and he said, I don't want to say anything. This is not a time for you to speak. Yeah. It's a time for you to come alongside somebody, put an arm on their shoulders, um, give an encouraging word, a supportive word when the opportunity presents it. Um, don't give a sermon. Yeah. Um, 
It's not your place to do that. They're not ready to listen now to you. They just want you to be there. Mm -hmm. You see, the capacity to listen is a spiritual consolation, says, says Vito. The capacity just to listen. And sometimes friend just wants you to listen. Or your wife just wants you to listen. They don't need you to respond always. <laughs> you need to distinguish when that's all they're requesting from you. Support of counseling requires the pastor to reassurance uh, to members who lack self-confidence or also. Um, in cases where you have people who lack self-confidence, don't shout them off, don't push them away, and don't give idle words either of encouragement. You need to impart realistic hope in these people's lives. Um, prayer is also very important in support of counseling. Uh, we tell, recommends that you memorize certain psalms, and he gives a list of psalms, Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 30. There's also other scripture that gives comfort and support. Now, you have this old, uh, not a prayer book, which the Methodists and the Anglicans use, which give you all the verses for the different time. It would be good to get one of those for yourselves. Because just in case you need to find a passage very quickly that is appropriate in that situation, mm -hmm. then you have this little booklet with you. Mm -hmm. Don't worry that it's Methodist or whatever. No, no, no. It's very, very handy to have. Yeah. This educational counseling, Premarital counsel would also be educational, obviously, because they need to learn now before they get married. Then you have family counseling on divorce, remarriage, adultery. You perhaps get a Catholic and a Protestant wanting to get married. You're going to have to sit them down. And they are going to have to that's, sit them down. That's going to be a rough one. It's going to be a rough one. <laughs> but they're going to have to understand each other's faith. Yeah. Um, the pastor either imparts knowledge or he can offer resource materials. If you don't know enough, there is resources available. Yeah. Go and find it, tell your congregation to make it. Make it available to them, maybe you get a little bit of Ask them to read through, for example, of pieces of it and then just say, listen, let's meet on that today. Read this piece and I'm going to read it as well and then we can talk about it. That's another form of doing it. Um, what is your task? Your concern with motives, symptoms, causes and purposes of people's actions. Do not moralize or reprimand. Those methods are more akin to preaching as a preventative for emotional disturbances, for future emotional disturbances. Your primary concern should be to find out what has brought about alienation between the person and God, or between him and his family, and how to mend the broken relationship. That's your, your primary concern. And then, especially in, in your uh, Gospels, it says when Jesus saw them, he had compassion on them. It's a necessary trait for you to develop, um, to have compassion on people. Because it will help you to focus on the needs of the one who's in trouble. Help the client or the person to become free of the hindrances which prevent him making a reasonable decision. A pastoral counselor may have the opportunity to reconstruct lives by pointing those who come to him to the grace of God as integrating, as the integrating the source of life. Sometimes you might be the only person that shows full acceptance of another person as a counsellor and it is vital because that's going to determine how the relationship works out or whether it's going to be successful or not. Mm. Uh, if you're going to give spiritual guidance for example, then remember repentance is a prerequisite to restoration mm. of any relationship for a person who has done wrong. And then don't force them into confession. They must come to their own confession. You never force them into confession. Um, because that confession will then not be genuine. And their forgiveness, whatever the experience they have, will be half baked. Often the one needing counsel is aware of his guilt but may be defensive in order to protect his image. Then you have the process of counselling. First step, obviously, listen. Second step, I would also say is listen. And third is also to say, I would say is listen. However, uh, Beatles says listen, and then summarise, give back, as in a conversation, mm -hmm. to say, this is how I hear you. 
But that means is when you say to the person, this is what I hear, then you're leaving also the person to correct you and say, okay, this and this. Mm -hmm. they, or they might give extra facts, mm -hmm. which they didn't give earlier. No, that's not actually yeah. what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so yeah. there must be that back and front. So make sure that you understand the actual problem. Because if you give them back the actual problem, then you half won them over because you listened. Oh. Then you start outlining alternative paths of action and to explore the end. Um, never suggest to them which course of action to take. If there's alternative, let them choose their own action. They may have their own thing worked out already. They might have just come to you to actually... Confirmation. Con for confirmation. Yeah. But that might also be... That route that they take might also be uh, a route which does not necessarily negate other hindrances that they don't want to deal with. And that you need to be careful of and need to pick up during the session with them. Say again? Um, there might be things in their lives, for mm -hmm. example, um, in terms of concepts and role play and so forth, where they decide to take a particular route. Okay, okay. But that route doesn't deal with the actual issues uh, that yeah. you see in yeah. front of you. It's kind of a scapegoat for this. It order. might be a scapegoat. So yeah. you need to be very aware of, of, of what. And then you might have to renegotiate you know, the process yeah, kind of and, and ask questions again and um, stimulate the thinking as to their roles, their definitions mm -hmm. of concepts and so forth before you take it a little further. Let them choose their own course of action and then give emotional support and inspiration. Often they know what to do, but they lack the strength and motivation. The pastor should instruct the person how to pray and to live by faith. And there's lots of examples of prayer in the Bible that you can often use to give to the person. Like I, the one I gave you, the, the one pre or Paul, there's other examples of that. Yeah. And they are very specific with the deal with specific situations. So you can use those types of prayers to do it. Wait for all. <laughs> Don't give fixed advice or make decisions for the person. Do not assume responsibility for the client. Learn how to work with him. Always learn how to work with him. If you can help the person to 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 develop the capacity to make their own decisions, then you're helping them to make sure. And that's where I'm going to end the rest of the video.